Writing is my favorite thing to do. Have you heard about the Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention? They'll have writing workshops, writing classes, and more. June 16th through 18th, 2017, at the Renaissance Airport Hotel in St. Louis, Missouri. Cool! Where can I sign up? Go right now to www.stlwritersguild.org and click on GatewayCon. www.stlwritersguild.org and click on GatewayCon? That's right. See you there. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. <laughs> Back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Things and president of Winding Trails Media, president of St. Louis Writers Guild. And I know you just heard the advertisement. I'm going to do it again. And that is coming up on June 16th, 17th, and 18th is Gateway Con, the Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention. The conference is a full on full blown. Writers' conference with being able to pitch to agents and lots of classes, master classes. The convention is a free to the public book fair. So come one, come all. And with me today is the Madame herself of murder. Fedora Amos, I write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And at Gateway Con, since I am president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime, please come to our workshop, which is called I Love a Mystery, and we're going to share why we love it and why you can write one that everybody will love. Okay. Uh, I'm George Saroy. I'm the vice president of the Missouri Writers Guild. Um, and I write science fiction for the young adult reader. Uh, both of my uh, Excelsior books, Excelsior and Ever Upward, Part 2 and the Excelsior Journey, are expected to be launched uh, this summer, as well as the relaunch of my five parts um, sci-fi sports serial from Parts Unknown. Um, and I am also a, um, getting to be a more and more experienced uh, voiceover artist and audiobook narrator for more information. Go to my new website at he'sgotit.com. My name is Jennifer Stolzer. Sounds like Stolzer. Porto, George. <laughs> Are you sure it's not? <laughs> well, it was my by under. George. By George, he's Porto got it. By George. Yeah. My name is Jennifer Stolzer. I'm not the president of anything. <laughs> yeah, you're a secretary, aren't you? I am. I'm you're a secretary, a secretary yes. of the uh, St. Louis Writers Guild. Uh, I write fantasy and draw pictures for a living. So check out my fantasy novel, Threadcaster, on which I drew the picture. Nice. Yeah. Uh, look for Jen 2024. Ready for president. Go, <laughs> <laughs> Jen. I'd go for her. I'd go for her. Tell call right now. I you would. Said, you said you were president of anything. I, you know, you're going to put yet. me in charge of president of the United States. <laughs> Heck yeah. I hope you enjoy me looking like a ragged mess. <laughs> It's supposed to drain you. It uh, will succeed. So you'll see that. I won't digest anything properly for at least four years, if not longer. I like it. Uh, I'm Brad R. Cook. I am the author of many a steampunk thing, like the Iron Chronicles. Uh, you can also find A Clockwork Heart and The Dragon Slayer, thanks to all of you who just bought it. I just got uh, that little residual from Amazon. So. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. and that, was a, that was a fun get. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Apparently later this year I will be releasing more, so uh, <laughs> check out for you know all of that coming soon. And a uh, quick shout out to Miss Wasco's fourth and fifth graders over at Booter Elementary. I had a blast hanging with you guys. We talked all about writing, talked all about you know story stuff, and they did love your art, by the way. So, oh, hooray! Yes, uh, it was very good times. Uh, they were fascinated to learn just how many of them could be involved in writing, especially the artists who had no idea. <laughs> one can be an artist and work in the book industry. So if you're an artist, 
You can work in the book industry too. Indeed. <laughs> All you need to know is where your safe safe zones are. Exactly. Yes. And by safe zones, I mean on your canvas. Although safe zones in general are also good to know. <laughs> Take this as my official presidential slogan: Know your safe zones. <laughs> safe words are over. He's got it. Dot com. <laughs> yes. Twenty twenty four. Okay. I'm Melanie Lucas. Um, I'm trying to decide if the writing I've done, which I actually have done, really, it counts. You did it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for my fantasy novel, counts as writing a fantasy novel, uh, or at least replotting my fantasy novel. Um, and uh, I also write nonfiction that no one ever reads because it is for my job. <laughs> well, it's not so much no one ever reads; it's science, scientific work. So. Well, in this case, it's a. Uh, me doing editing for other people's informed consents. True. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they were all talking about the other stuff before that. Well, yeah, that hasn't been for a while. Yes. <laughs> all right. Anyway, today we've got kind of two topics that spiral into each other. I'm borrowing the Torah's term for from which to talked off mic. Mm -hmm. First topic is what keeps you writing? Writing forever. The second topic is why do you write what you write? Why were you drawn to this and so forth? Um, this, while this episode was planned, we actually planned back in January of this year, it's kind of odd that it would come up now because last night I had a very interesting conversation with my wife, Melanie, who you just heard from. Actually, Melanie talked me off the cliff or off the roof or whatever you want to call it because I was within a cat's whisker of, of chucking this entire industry and saying to hell with it. I'm done. I can't grow. I have not grown. Um, for those who don't know, I've had to put myself on hiatus for several years, and believe me, I'm paying for that. Even though what I did, I did was right. Still, I'm paying for it. So no good deed goes unpunished. Um, however, so to my question to all of you, and I know Brad, you're up first. Why do you keep? Going. I mean, we've got an entire industry where people who don't know what they're talking about will go up and criticize you or say, oh, I could easily do that. A three-year-old can write. So you Try being someone who draws for a living. <laughs> uh, yeah, and actually I was borrowing that from... <laughs> it's like, I could do that. Yeah. It's like, okay, good, go ahead. I tried. I'll wait. They look like stick figures. <laughs> yeah, nobody liked it. <laughs> and before turn over, Brad, a friend of mine, uh, one of my artist friends, and one you've met... Mm -hmm. Uh, was talking about how this, well, I forget what she, this woman's major was, but she decided to take an art class because she thought that was going to be easy and it so forth. social work. Thank you. Yeah. And um, now she cries every time she goes there, realizing how hard it is. Mm. Okay, Brad and then Fedora. Sorry. Yay, hey, I get to follow that. No. Um, <laughs> crying, 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 crying item, yes. inadequacy. Yes. Well, know that that wall is, uh, that's there. That Every writer hits that more than once. Um, so just know that you're you're not alone in that. Uh, try writing a New York Times bestseller your first day out, and then having to repeat that <laughs> because now <laughs> you've got huge giant publishers coming down on you and everything like that. So there are many many walls that you're going to smash into in this industry. Uh, but here is what I actually wanted to say. Not that um, trying to be hopeful here. <laughs> Damn it. Um, but yeah, so um, I'm actually going to quote uh, a guy sitting out in Arizona, uh, Harvey Stanbrow. Uh, who has a challenge, an open challenge to any writer that he talks to, uh, to stop writing. If, if you really want to not be a writer, stop writing. Because guess what? It's not going to happen. You're going to keep writing. You're going to keep creating. You're going to keep doing it. We can't stop. That's why we do it. We can stop the episode right now. Why do we do it? Because we can't stop. Come on, Brad. <laughs> I can quit whenever I want. You can try. <laughs> it's harder than heroin, man. Come on. After Fedora and George, we yeah. come back to that. Because that's an interesting thing. Go ahead. Well, I think that there are two reasons. I'm only going to talk about one. It, it's really what Brad was talking about. That things come to us. <laughs> I, and I think they probably come to everybody ideas that is that we think would make good stories and most ordinary people will have a glass of wine and say <clears throat> I don't really want to do that <laughs> but writers 
we just don't let them go or they won't let us go. And they keep pounding us in the head and nagging at us. Write that zombie story. You know you want to. And I didn't, but I wrote it anyway. That's how <laughs> tough those voices can be. So it is that we have an urge, again, a desire, a whatever it is, that nags us until we just have to do something about it. And his guilt trips to to a two at times. Oh yeah, that too, and also a lot of self doubt, which you were uh -huh. engaging in yesterday, and you wonder whether it's all worth it, and then back come the voices nagging again. Yep. Uh, yeah. When it comes to when it comes to writing for it for me, my whole thing is like there is just a yearning to tell a specific kind of story, and the best way for me to tell that story is you know like basically is basically just simply writing it down because I'm the only one that I have to rely on to get that done. I don't have to rely on other people. I don't have to rely on producers to want to make that particular film or TV show or anything like that. I don't have to rely on excuse me, I don't have to rely on like a stage to rent in order to put that play up. You know, it's basically just like just a matter of just getting the story out and hoping that it works. That's basically like what um, what William Goldman has gone gone and said. Just like you just got to figure out the effing story and pray that it works. Mm -hmm. And when it uh, to follow up on what Brad was talking about before, just saying how everyone hits that wall. Everyone who cares about their writing hits that wall. Yeah. Hacks don't care. You know, like if yeah. and you know, there are plenty of, of writers that are out there right now that are you know, like that are on Facebook and just basically just kind of pining away about how they feel that they're a hack. Um, if you, the fact that you, if, you know, the fact that you can feel that sort of feeling, that proves that you're not. So don't worry about that. You know, like you 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 care about your writing. You give a damn about it. You want it to be the best it can. But at the same time, you know, like the best way to that you can accomplish that is to get off of Facebook and sit down and write. You know, like so, that's one of those. It's one of those things. It's just like, yes, we're here for you, but at the same time, it's just like, we also want to encourage you to get away from the distraction of social media so that you can actually, write, you know, write the story down. True. Now this is going to come back, and I'll go go to Brad. Brad, you talked about with with Harvey's um, challenge out there, which I had completely forgotten about until you said it. I don't know about anyone else here, but for you know, as I mentioned before, I had to go on hiatus for a while. I won't go into details, but everyone around the table knows what happened. Um, but I think you can go back to like yeah, two I, seasons. Yeah, talk. really. Like, like when you're in the <laughs> middle of it, you're talking talk about, about it. it. I think I did talk about it. It's but, probably in an episode called uh, Hiatuses or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. But during that time, which I was completely unable to write. Not because I didn't have story ideas, I just could not write. I went through some massive depression. I mean, not clinically, but you guys know around here, I was really, really, really in a bad shape mentally. Because well, you get punished if you don't listen to those voices. You really do. Mm -hmm. exactly. you, you, you do, and it's, they won't shut the hell up. That's right. Brad, go ahead. Well, speaking of the voices, uh, I actually <laughs> believe that these are the same voices that draw serial killers into, like, what they do. You know, Shh, don't Passion. call them like I just, yeah, you know, like, I, I honestly think, because these voices are driving. You know, it's the same people who stare at TVs and think the static is talking to them or something like that and go completely crazy. Writers are like this. We just channel it lovingly into words. Uh -huh. You know, because that's our medium. I mean, if I... if. If I were not a writer, and I just got asked this, and the reality of the question is, if I could do anything, I'd probably be making movies. I'd be Joss Whedon. I'd be, you know, somebody like that, because I would love to tell in that medium. But guess what? No one's going to hand me $100 million and say, here, go make Iron Horseman. You know, I would love that, but no one's going to do that, so it's okay. I'm going to write a book. You don't have the background for it anyway, do well, you? Oh, well, I, I have some yeah. films that I could, you know, if, if I'd stuck with the film industry, maybe, but that was not where I really thought I was going to go with that. You know, if I wasn't telling stories in this way, I'd probably be telling stories in some other way. I'm super jealous of songwriters. Oh, yeah. Because they can do, basically, tell this whole little tale and everything, and they do it, like, it's four minutes long or something. And they can crack out a track in a day. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I have to write a year, or spend a year on <laughs> something that somebody ingests in an hour or something, mm-hmm. you know, like it takes a day. And just I'm not like, so sure that all of them at least write that fast. No, but you can't. You know, it's like, like poetry. You'll hear I mean, about these, like, you know, you'll years. hear about the stones or something like that locking themselves away in some English manor for the weekend and coming they out. They just with borrowed like stuff from Chuck <laughs> Mary. You know? Yeah! <laughs> so it's like, He's you know, the code. <laughs> you know, and I'm always jealous of poets because they can, you know, crank out all these thoughts and they can do a huge range of stuff. But the reality is, is I don't think I'm ever not going to write something that I want to write. Mm-hmm. You know, I've written a romance, I've written paranormals, I've written middle grades, I've written, uh, you know, all kinds of things, some of which I won't even admit to having written. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, no, you will find yeah. it on George's <laughs> website. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, I think it's just one of those things, like, why do we do this? It's partly because we can't stop, it's partly because this is the way we create you know, my, my wife is a sculptor. She's an artist. She can do all kinds of mediums, but her favorite is stone. You know, that's that's awesome. That's her medium. My medium happens to be words. I really wish I could draw. If I could draw, it would have changed my life. I'd be making anime movies. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <And laughs> anyone can draw. You just have to practice a lot. And I if you like that. it, then you practice it. a lot by, by Someday I'll nature. show you my horrible 2D-ish looking 3D stuff. That sounds great. Uh, it's so great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm classic of the like turn to the left pose with their foot so you can still show the foot. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even draw a doodle that you would recognize. <laughs> Join the party. Um, one thing you still talk about was you'd make movies. Well, of course, script writers are in as the term exposed. The writers. That's why I went into playwright. Yeah. And you really don't have to be that great of a writer to get yourself out there. Okay, now that, we picked on George Lucas. A lot. A lot. But also, too, because we love his work. And he's unfathomably rich and completely untouchable. Well, yeah. He never listened. Yeah. <laughs> he never listened to okay. us anyway. And he still was a, I mean, he came up, you know, you've got Indiana Jones, you've got Star Wars, you've got, and you've got, and you've got to keep going. Willow. Willow. I'm going to forget Willow. <laughs> But, and of course he had Howard the Duck. Okay, I forgive him slightly. No, we don't. No. <laughs> but let me, let me no. use another example. These, the dialogue is not that great. It's still the story. And by the way, I don't know why when I've talked about fight scenes, I've never talked about this movie series because every fight in this movie is exactly what Brad and I talk about in writing fight scenes. Sylvester Stallone, Rocky. Every single Rocky. Okay, not the best writing in the world. I'm sorry, <laughs> Mr. Salone. But hey, yet you good? have done a great job. You've created a legend. You've created a. You follow the story line. Follow the story structure, which most writers who don't know story structure couldn't even come up with. And the fight scenes are stories in themselves and perfect. Which Stallone choreographed himself. Yeah. Out of out of necessity, because he originally had a, a choreographer that was just going through the motions that we had seen in all these other movies. Uh-huh. And he was the one, along with Garrett Brown, who was the um, the operator of the Steadicam, that really kind of like formed that you know that sort of style, the way that the way that it wound up being. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I will. I stand by the whole you know like Rocky franchise. It's one of my. The original is one of my all-time favorite films, and I love the whole, you know, the whole franchise. So, and like J.K. Rowling being on her, basically on her last time, he was too, basically. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say you mentioned time. two things right there, where those people are literally at at that wall, yeah, yeah. and then created something amazing. There's always that, you know, so that we that feeling of like yeah. that <laughs> sudden inspiration that just comes around at that at that right time. Uh-huh. For you know Stallone, it was just happy to see Ali versus Chuck Wepner. Right. When Chuck when Chuck Webner knocked Ali down and almost lasted all fifteen rounds, right? So like that's it always happens. There's always like that little bit of inspiration, and you never know when it's going to hit. But if you give up, if you walk away from it and everything, then you're basically just keeping that moment from happening. Yeah. You're not keeping your eyes open and insisting he starred it. Yeah, Stolen. that too. That was the other. Yeah, yeah, they were throwing six figures yeah. at him for that script. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, no, I want to star in it. Yep. And ironically, I mean, not ironically is the wrong word, but he actually made the right choice. Nine times out of ten, that would have been the wrong choice, but he made the right choice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You do have to be able to back up your ideas yeah. with some uh, actual work. Yes. Yes. Let's not forget that. 
Yes, and that is the hardest part. I mean, was this was the um, secret to every success in writing and other arts? But seat, sit it, <laughs> and get yeah. to it. Well, and, and you know, I actually just said this to the class, but I say this a lot. Being a writer is not necessarily about knowing grammar. Yes, you need to know the rules of grammar. Sure. But really, it's about storytelling. It's mm -hmm. about story crafting. Mm -hmm. You know, the the best grammatical people in the world become editors. Yeah. <laughs> more than likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, not necessarily do they make the best writer. I should say that you don't need that, you know, high, high English degrees to become a great writer. There are a ton of great writers out there who probably couldn't form a sentence in real life to save their butt. Mm -hmm. But they can they can create a beautiful and amazing story. Yeah. And that's almost what's more important. You know, that's what you're trying that's what we really need. Because otherwise we're creating some really well written, boring stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stuff that will put you to sleep after reading a paragraph. So this is go ahead. Um, just to you know, just to add on to the editing part. I'm kind of dealing with that right now with this um, upcoming relaunch of Excelsior. Probably by the time you guys hear this, um, it will have hopefully been out there, <laughs> um, been out there on time. Um, the main thing that I you know really have to, have to say is like it can be very, it can be you know like a, quite the blow to your confidence when you get back your editor's notes. Oh yeah, especially on something that you have insisted that is ready to go. From you know the previous edition that has gone out, and all of a sudden you realize that another editor has taken that sledgehammer to it, and it's created a lot more cracks than you think. You know, but just like what David said, but seat sit. You have to get through that period. You know where you feel like your ego is you know kind of taking a shot and everything. You have to get through it. That's part of this whole process, and it cannot be avoided. I think part of that is remembering that. In the end, really, it's all about making a great book. Yeah. You know, the reason why you're coming back, because I've, I've heard this time and time again, and when I get my notes back at first, it can feel that way. But then I always sit there and I look at it, and I always think about, you know, how is this making it better? Mm -hmm. You know, because sometimes it's, it really is. You know, you didn't think about this, and suddenly it's a great idea. Other times I run into it's not a good idea. But, you know, if you're willing to fight for that, fight for it. But... You know, I, I think that, because I've run into a lot of, when I was in publishing, a lot of authors who would be very upset at edits, mm -hmm. taking it incredibly personally to the point of, like, you know, you're, you're switching two words, and they're like, no, I had them in that order for a reason. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, fine, whatever. But, you know, I, it's, it's because it's our babies. It's because we love them. It's because of these obsessions that we're talking about that we think it's right. But then, yes, somebody can come along easily and tell you that this would be better this way, or you might want to try this, you know, in another way. Yeah. So, I, I, I don't know. I honestly think that most editors are really there to make it better. Now, if you have a bad editor, that's a different story. That yeah. is a different story, but we'll go back on to the... Go ahead. I think that the editors, most especially editors, are really trying to improve your book always. I'm not sure that's always the case with agents. I have a friend who had an agent who uh and you know it was her first first getting an agent and she was real happy to have an agent but this agent seemed to want to rewrite the book hmm. because let's face it a number of editors and agents too are just sort of miffed writers <laughs> yeah. they wish that they could write they really can't find the way to do it or have a decent idea or something and so they will use the people that are their authors as a way to express themselves. And so you have to be really careful and know what you're about. Know what your core story is and what you're willing to give up and what you're not. And what should be changed and what should not. Good. That's exactly kind of what, you know, I should say this topic is trying to, today is trying to come across. Mm -hmm. Why we write what we write. Because it's what's inside of us. It's what's there. It's what we want. It's not what somebody else wants. Right. Yeah. You know? So that's you know partly about finding your niche and where you are, and then know it. It's yours. You know your name's on the book. And that's kind of the thing I always try to tell authors is that no matter what happens, your editor's name is not on that book. It's mm -hmm. your name. So own it. Make it yours. What I was thinking about with the agent, it's possible. No idea in this specific case. Could be this is what the agent thought they could sell. 
Oh, no, no, that's, yeah, that's, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here, like, perfect example. So, Iron Horseman. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I first wrote it, I submitted it to agents. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful agent picked it up and was like, this is pretty good, actually. I met her at a conference and talked to her about it. And she, she read it. She's like, I really like some of it, but I think it would do better as a middle grade in terms of marketability and sales and everything oh. that was going on at the time. There wasn't a ton of steampunk middle grade. I could see exactly what she was meaning. Hmm. So we worked. I rewrote the entire friggin' beginning as a middle grade and sent it back off to her. Now, what I should have done in retrospect was probably just handed her a middle grade and said, would this be better? Mm -hmm. Uh, But in reality, so we worked for six months back and forth where she was like, you know, this would be much better. But I didn't like it because Mm -hmm. it's not the story I was trying to tell. I was not trying to tell the story of an 11-year-old who's running around and finding himself as a, you know kind of that first emergence, I was writing a coming-of-age tale about a 16-year-old mm-hmm. who's, you know, finally becoming a warrior and standing up for himself and creating his own life. And after several months, I turned in this, you know, middle grade, and she came back and she said, you know what, this just isn't working, we're going to pass on it. Mm-hmm. It was crushing. I was like, oh, after it's you so worked sad. For six months on it. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and, uh, and I'd done other things at that time, so like I'm just like, this one focused thing, but I'd been pretty legitimately rewritten the whole thing. And it was a crush to come back, but I have to say, in the end, what I have now is a much better book. Iron Horseman is a middle is a YA. It is a young adult tale. I have since written many a middle grade, and they are way better in terms of being an actual middle grade than what Iron Horseman ever could have been. But the point is, is that what she was really trying to do was not necessarily say I'm going to take Iron Horseman and turn it into the greatest thing that's ever been. She was looking at Iron Horseman and saying, you know, this would actually do really well as a middle grade right now. Because middle grades are hot. There's not a huge chunk of uh, steampunk middle grade at the time. So, you know, it would have fit into a really nice niche. And that's what an agent is for. They're supposed to, you know, we see... The industry in this grandiose macro sense. Uh-huh. The agent knows all those little itsy bitsy places where they might be able to fit you. And so I think a lot of it comes down to marketability. I always think that when I, agents are a lot having to do with the, the marketability of a novel and to be a success. Because that's how they get money, that's how they get paid. Right, they've got bills to pay, they need that. Yeah, they only get 15% of what you make. Yeah. <laughs> I think Brad has a really good point. Most specifically about knowing the audience that you want to write for, whether it's middle grade or young adult or new adult, or whether it is older people or the people who love the uh, women's fiction market, know what your market is, who you're trying to reach. I think that's an important thing. And it's equally important to find the right medium for the Mm storyline. As artists, for example, they have a lot of choices. They could do oil painting or sculpture or mixed media or this, that, or the other. Well, we as writers do too. We can do novels, we can do short stories, we can do screenplays, and probably all of us have experimented with all of those different kinds of media and we need to Mm -hmm. make sure that it fits the particular story we're trying to sell, yeah. that we're trying to write, that we want to complete. So everything has to fit together is what I'm suggesting here. And that's part of choosing what it is that you want to write too, as well as having a desire to write something, you have to have some pretty good idea of what it is that you want to write and how best to present it. Yeah, and going along with that, and you get the credit, tell me if I'm full of, it, full of it or not, but another thing is writing you know, you always hear the thing, write what you know. Well, you know, if you know if you know how to file legal files, nobody's really going to care about that too much in the story. Tell J.K. Rowling that. Yeah, I, I, yeah I know. Forget. But, but what I'm going with is sometimes, though, you've got to figure out what it is you really know. What do you love? Brad loves steampunk. He focuses on steampunk. And he's fought for that with being YA. One of the things I've had to struggle with is, hey, I'm a martial artist. I've been a martial artist since I was 9 or 10 years old. I'm now <coughs> 48 um, years old. I'm 43 black belt. 
but I have always had problems writing about martial artists. Well, for the last four months, which by the way, this is being taped in April, um, while I know it won't be airing until May, I have been trying anything other than writing a martial arts story. Because, hey, you watch a martial arts film, unless it's been Karate Kid or something like that, it feels junky. In fact, Iron Fist, while I liked it, had that aspect to it. Um, so, somebody talked me into it last night. Not that, specifically not, martial arts. Well, but you, it was part of what you were talking mm -hmm. about. And so I'm just starting today on a brand new project with that. We'll see where it goes. I know. Don't look at me. I, Jen's, Jen's shaking her head. She's mad at me. I know why. Because I keep abandoning them. But we'll see hey, what happens. That was actually the primary thrust of the conversation, Jen. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Uh, to, uh, ah, crap, I had a point. No, it's going. No. Nope, sorry. <laughs> Dang it, it was a good one, too. Oh, well, we'll come back to it in a second. Are we talking about writing what you know? <laughs> yes, thank you! <laughs> <laughs> See, you got me thrown up with the whole, like, anyway. Oh, yeah. uh, so this is what I was going to say. This is a common thing, actually. I was just uh, using it at the class the other day, so this is kind of oddly topical. Um, I look at it as the whole write what you know thing. It's, it's so weird, because mm -hmm. if that's the case, I'm not a woman. How can I write about girls and my stories and right. stuff like that? So... What I truly believe is, is that we have a sandbox, and you spend your entire life filling it with sand. And yes, when you're small and you're in school, it's not the biggest sandbox. You can only make little castles and stuff like that. But guess what? By the time that we're, you know, adults and stuff, that sandbox is pretty big, and you can make actual cool sand sculptures. Which, in essence, what we're doing is novelists and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we're creating these giant vistas, these really cool, you know, stories and everything that go along with it. And that's what I mean with what you know. So what is the sand? Well, the sand is your martial arts. Mm -hmm. It's my knowledge of engineering. It's my knowledge of archaeology. It's my knowledge of history. It's my knowledge of medicine. It's my knowledge of film. You know, story structure, all of that kind of stuff coming together. So, you know, when they say write what you know, you know a lot and you have this huge repertoire of stuff that you can pull from. And I think that's what they know. And so, you know, the, the point becomes fill your sandbox with everything that you can. Learn about poisons. Learn about weird things that no one's going to, you know. Let your Google search be something the NSA is concerned about. <laughs> yeah. I would agree. Um, who was first? Go ahead. Um, I think write what you know is an unreliable phrasing that everyone's adopted. Uh -huh. What it intends to say is write authentically. Exactly. You can write authentically about a lot of things that you actually have not personally experienced if you have a knowledge for it. But it's very obvious when you try and write something when you don't have an authentic understanding of how it works. That's how we end up with the same characters written in the same way over and over again on a bunch of different novels, people who just see what, whose experience, whose what they know is only couched in stereotype and, uh, and famous examples. Uh, if it's the, we've brought it up many times with our favorite asthmatic over here. <laughs> you know, um, that, you know, Brad, he gets upset when the asthmatic kid is only shown asthmatic because he keeps huffing on his inhaler when he knows exactly how inhalers work. I just and saw the, that the other day, and too. The kid is probably going to pass out. <laughs> he might he might kill himself if he takes too much of that. Exactly. But Why is Hollywood, that jittery and freaking out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood doesn't have, uh, often doesn't have an authentic view of that. And that's what write what you know means. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Write authentically so that you do respectful service to every one and thing included in your story. Yeah, I, I don't need to take a hit to breathe. <laughs> you do one, and then you're good for a couple hours. <laughs> and if it's not that way... Yeah, you need to go to the hospital. You're not going to be like, oh my god, scary thing! If you, know, if you still can't breathe, it's time to go to the hospital. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, I think Brad and Jen are both right mm -hmm. that there is more than one kind of knowledge. Brad was talking about factual knowledge and... Uh, Jen was talking about experiential kinds of knowledge, and we've got that. We've also got, I think, spiritual knowledge. Yeah. So that writing what you know isn't just about the facts. It's not just about experience either. It is about your intuition. It's about everything that your brain can do, which is why I 
honestly don't think that even if we have artificial intelligence, it's going to be good enough <laughs> to be human. Um, yeah, to, to throw in my two cents on write what you know, uh, for me it's also been like write what you have gravitated towards in life. What is, you know, what is there a, um, what specific genre, what specific type of story has grabbed you in, su in some way, shape, or form that you have to put your own little spin on it? Uh, for me, you know, like it's been growing up watching, you know, different films that play to the Campbellian hero's journey template and really responding to that in a way that not even realizing until years down the road just how similar they are and what you can do to kind of put your own spin on it. Um, that's basically the way it, the way it was for me with Excelsior. It was once I figured out that, you know, that that specific type of story structure is something that I've always responded to, then I was able to kind of take that form format and really just kind of put it into this, um, into this character's storyline and everything just came to life in a way that I never imagined. Well, I think George is spiraling around to something that is a part of this topic also, and that's getting us around to genre, and why we choose specific kinds of genre to use to write in. And I think that is part of the same reason in a way, but different too, in that I think we write because we can't not write, as we've already suggested. But why do we pick mystery or romance or science fiction over anything else? And I think that's because we have a desire to read it. It's what we want to read, and there's not enough or not of the right stuff out there for us to read. And so how else are we going to get it except writing it ourselves? So that is what I attempt to do. I think there is not enough humorous, historical fiction <laughs> that is based upon actual fact and gives people an idea of pop culture of an era more than 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to read, but not enough people are writing it. In fact, hardly anybody is. And so I think it's, it's not just that what I want to write. It's my duty. It's my duty to write that. There you go. Mm -hmm. And so I do. I'm glad you launched right into that topic because that's where I was going to go next anyway. So, George? Yes. Define your, define your genre. For me. My genre is, um, as I you know, say it almost every, every, epi every episode here, it's science fiction for the young adult reader. Okay. Uh, basically, what that means is I really enjoy the, um, enjoy how young adult books read. Um, how they, you know, just really, how they have a great pace to them, how they have really interesting characters that really kind of propel the action forward. And I felt that when I try to read straight science fiction or fantasy, it tends to get a little bogged down in the world building, which I can always appreciate. I always appreciate the world building. Got, you know, like, that's something that I've really, that's, that's always been something for me I've always felt has been a weakness of mine. I've all, I, but that's purely impatience on my part. I just want to, you know, keep going with the story. Um, and so I found that that sort of style works the best when it comes to the stories that I want to tell. Now, the reason why I say science fiction for the young adult reader and not just young adult is because in a lot of cases, especially with, uh, from Parts Unknown and the stories that are going to be following the three-part Excelsior journey, um, those those stories, their main characters are adults. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I really like the style that I write. I'm really comfortable with it. I enjoy it. And that is obviously a, the key factor when it comes to our writing. We have to love our own writing. We have to really enjoy what it is that we put down on paper. Um, and so I wanted to just kind of tell that same sort you know same style of story. So I just kind of just said, like, all right, it's going to be, as I said, science fiction for the young adult reader. I have a question for you, because I want to clarify. When you said you enjoy your own writing, you, mm -hmm. you enjoy the words you wrote, or you enjoy the genre you're writing? Uh, you enjoy both 
really it's it's kind of a, it's kind of a threefold. It's the words you're writing, mm-hmm. um, it's the genre that you're writing in, and more than anything, it's the story that you want to tell. Agreed. Jen, hmm. I'm going to toss it at you. I know you write fantasy. I write fantasy. And I know you. Am I right in saying you're working on a ghost story fantasy right now? I, I am, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> she knew what she was drawing and from across the room, even though I couldn't see the paper. Um. So what draws you to it? Well, I I like fantasy and sci-fi for the same reason. Uh, I like looking at the world and thinking of it outside of the box that I'm used to seeing it in. I like characters and seeing reflections of who we are and who my friends are and who I am uh, in different places that we will never be. Like, I'm never going to be a uh, a person who lives in Threadcaster world because it's not a real place. But I can put little bits of myself in all these people and see how they would grow and change through their different environments and... and trials and things that don't exist in the real world and it's just it's it's delicious little brain teaser so i like fantasy because it lets you sort of stretch out in infinite parallel worlds i'm kind of hoping somewhere our books actually exist <laughs> not me <laughs> threadcaster land sucks <laughs> uh, so i write escapism uh, it's probably the easiest way of putting it um, no matter where I'm writing it, that tends to be what I'm writing. I don't write, uh, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're going to escape your reality for a bit. Whether you're an adult who's reading one of my more, you know, whether it's a romance or a sci-fi or something like that. If you're a young adult who's reading like uh, the Iron Horseman or Iron Lotus or Iron Zulu and any of these. You know, if you're a middle grader and you're reading even some of the stuff that I'm going to be pushing out soon. uh, You know, like, I would love to say, yes, I write mostly for kids. But saying that negates all the adults who are reading my book. So, uh, yes, I do tend to focus. What I find is I tend to write stories that, uh, if they were made, would probably be in the PG range. Uh Uh-huh you know, would be aimed at a mass family market. Am I doing that on purpose? Uh, A little bit, I guess. But really, I'm just writing a tale, and I'm... Yes, I'm thinking about where it goes on the shelf. Sure. But really, I'm writing a tale and then, you know, figuring out where it goes, less creating where it goes and then writing the tale. It kind of sounds like Brad and I are very much, like, in that same sort of style, you know, like, of, of our writing, because... Um, I saw, you know, like I see similarities in my own and I see, you know, based on, you know, what, you know, what Brad chooses to write in, it sounds very much like we are kind of appealing to the same sort of people that read comics, Yeah, you know, and that is definitely not a damning thing because I am, you know, like a big fan and I'm sure Brad, you know, Brad is as well as I'm sure a lot of us are, you know, like, and that is basically kind of like the same sort of stigma that a lot of comic book writers and illustrators wound up being in. They felt for so many years that they were specifically pandering to kids or, you know, just simply like writing for children. And, but at the same time, you know, like there were, you know, so many other people that were reading them and making them the success that they were. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, one of the things that I find kind of fascinating is that we do approach like you know the, the, the readers and stuff in, in certain ways and to be honest I think that if you are I find especially with a lot of children's authors they're writing down to children they're they're teaching they're right. specifically trying to put in moral lessons and like you know do all this stuff and yes I do a little of that but I wrap it all in steampunk and fun and craziness like that I find that too often when people write for children, they're aiming down at them as mm-hmm. if they need to school them in some way. Uh, and I don't necessarily agree with that. The other thing I throw out is um, I do not write books for boys. Um, you know, even though my main character is a you know is a is a boy, uh, there's a girl who features just as prominently. Um, if I could have, I would have tagged the two of them, but that's not the way the industry works. They're like you gotta have a main character and then a side character, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I do. I, I I've written books with you know female protagonists. 
uh, because I don't ever want someone to pick up my book and say, oh, I can't read that, or that's not for me, or something like that. Like, I try and be inclusive in the sense of that. So I don't try and limit myself. And they're always like, you should write for, you know, the big one for middle grade writers, if you're a guy, is, well, you should be writing books for boys because boys don't read. And yeah, I, when I get a middle grade reader who is a young, you know, young male reader to read, that's awesome. But I certainly don't want to negate the, like, young female fans that I have. That would be horrible. Mm -hmm. Totally. Huh? No? Well, turn. I was just thinking that, uh, I was, uh, my first love, I think, is probably hardcore sci-fi, but I was now writing a fantasy novel, and I'm writing that genre right now, specifically, this is what I call a drawer novel. Namely, not that I never want anyone else to read it, but that I'm writing it with no intention of getting it published. Which is my mental way of saying, it doesn't matter if there's no way this will ever get published. I'm writing this, and the reason I'm writing it is because I want to work on my ability to do character development and some other things that are weak in my writing. And the reason I started this novel was so that I could go back to the second draft of my hardcore sci-fi novel, which I care about that world more. At least I did when I started. Um, and do a better job developing the characters there and having more realistic dialogue and do justice to what the way they are in my head. So in that case, my genre is based on my goals of the novel. And of course, I'm choosing something I'm interested in doing too. So going back to full circle, if you, if you, how do you keep, well, how do you talk people that you know that are good writers out of giving up? I mean, how do you, do you, do you ever bring up their genre? Do you ever remind them of why they, why they love their genre? Or do you, have you ever, actually, no, let me throw a different question at you. Have you ever considered changing genres completely? Now, I know, Fedora, you wrote a zombie story that, you know, I've written a screenplay. I write different stuff at different eras uh -huh. because I like to challenge myself. Yep. And I like a change. And if I've got an idea that's nagging me, hey, I've got to find the right kind of medium for it and go with that. Because fortunately, I do not have to make a living in this profession. <laughs> It'd be nice sometime if I read somebody. I get a you know a check every now and then, but it certainly wouldn't support me. No, get that nice change from Amazon. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Pay pays uh, for bubblegum. <laughs> So, yes, uh, I, you know, even though I say I've written, uh, you know, I write for kids, I write adventure stories, I write escapism, that is not all I've written. Uh, I probably, at this point, have written everything. So, obviously, everyone knows I started off in plays. So, I've done the play route, I've done movie scripts, I've done these kinds of scripts, you know, writing. Uh, and there is an element to that that I think is exceptionally good for storytelling. Um, however... Uh, in terms of novels, I have written mostly in fantasy. I've written many a sci-fi, uh, some of which uh, the short stories will probably drop later this year uh, when I finish them, because um, I've got a bunch that I just need to get cleaned up and get covers for. Uh, actually, some of them don't even need covers, because it's weird like that. Um, but anyway, uh, I have written romance novel um, that I try to get published and everything like that. Got some great critiques back on it. Still want to use it. I just need to stretch out the romance in the beginning. Apparently, I had everybody get together too quickly. Um, you know, so there's there's that kind of stuff. I've written nonfiction, uh, multiple nonfictions, and mm -hmm. right now I'm working on the history of St. Louis Writers Guild. Um, Guaranteed bestseller. He'll be on the New York Times <laughs> bestseller. No. Yeah, yeah. The the bestseller of like all the twenty or thirty copies that that's going to sell. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, like, I, I've literally written the rest. I'm not even going to admit to everything I've written, because some of it, uh, there's, you know, no point to admitting to, you know, that I've written that before. You're ashamed of it, but I, I admit it. I am I'm not ashamed, ashamed of it. I just don't know if I want people to know that it's out there and track it down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ashamed of it. Right I just now. don't want you to I find it. Exactly. Google real fast. No, no, you can't find it that way. <laughs> no. But seriously, like, you know, I have written a huge variety of things, and I constantly, for the same reason, I'm challenging myself. You know, I write in sci-fi, I write in uh, fantasy, I write in first person, I write in third person. Tried second person, that was really weird, so I'm not going back there. 
Though, uh, Reggie uh, pulled off second person, so hey, go him. Wow. Well, Reggie um, doesn't believe in rules. Exactly. You know, <laughs> and that's how he was able to do it. I never would have done it that way, but he did it greatly. Greatly? He did great. Anyway. Right. <laughs> oh, hey, America, we're going to drop it. We can create words. Can, can you tell them about Benadryls? No. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I just think it's, I, I think, yes, you can, there are plenty of people who walk into their one thing. You know, look at J.K. Rowling. She's trying to do other things, but we just won't let her. We yeah. only want mm-hmm. water. You know, so that can definitely happen. If that happened, I would love it. I am totally willing to have the one-hit wonder career where I'm like, you know, I just, for the next 30 years, I play that one song everywhere I go. You know, I'd be fine with that. You know, that's a great career. But uh, the reality is is that I think it's, it's testing the waters, doing different things. That's why I love short stories, because they give you that freedom to do whatever you want to do. Um, my my main genre is is science fiction um, and young adult, but at the same time, like I have you know branched out occasionally on you know some other things. Um, I've been writing pretty consistently really since um, since the nineteen nineties, and that was really where things really kind of started ramping up. Um, the first thing that I the first long uh, piece of work that I've um, ever finished was this action script that I wrote that when I was a sophomore in college, um, and then followed it up with a fu- um, feature length comedy, and you know just kind of like just throwing things you know different things around and everything, and at the same time like writing some uh, short stories, um, you know n- none of which really you know went anywhere. A couple of one act plays and um, um, you know, what else? Uh, it's it's definitely like you know gone in a lot of different places like writing for pop culture writing for um, for the pop culture site 411mania.com I was writing you know both news reports and columns consistently there from for about for over eight years um, and I even wrote you know like uh, when I was uh, when I first came up with from parts unknown that started off as a video game outline. And then it was just like, well, let's see how it works as a treatment for a script. So I wrote the treatment. Let's see how it works as a movie script. I wrote over 10 drafts of that script where different ideas came and went and everything and just, you know, nothing really came, came of it. Um, and, but then it, it was recognized by the New York International Independent Film and Video Festival. And then it was just like, all right, let's see how it is as a novel. And now it's completely, you know, completely been rewritten into the five-part serial that it is right now. So it goes all over the place. I'll occasionally stray from the, you know, from the genre to write, you know, just some little thing that's nagging me. But at the same time, it's just like you always kind of come back to that first love. And that first love for me was sci-fi. I'm going to ask everybody in the room to become a futurist for a little bit. I like it. Uh-oh. We have... <laughs> we now have, we have computers in our brains. Okay. I am now talking. Okay. Okay. <laughs> We have all been taught to be loners as writers because those are all classical models. And there may be a few successful collaborations out there. I think of Charles Todd, which is a mother-son combination, a really odd combination, I think, but it certainly works for them. But things are changing in education now. At Principia, for example, they don't have a library anymore. They have a media center. And they don't have a librarian. They have a media director. And they don't have people doing research papers by themselves. They do collaborative learning. They are learning to work with other people and get research from here, there, ideas from different heads, and then make a combination of that. And I was wondering if you thought that would impinge upon our private world as lone writers. I'm going to let Brad go, then Melanie, then I've got my own comment. Uh, to start off and kind of add to that, one of the kids uh, at, in the class uh, when asked, what do you want to be when you grow up, said that I want to make YouTube videos. Um, that is that is that was her career you know, path. And to be honest, that's a pretty good career path right now. Uh, you know, putting up these videos, making things like that. It's a storytelling. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's just using the media of video instead of words. Um, so I, I do think things will change. Having said that, no. I don't think <laughs> books are going away, and I think we're still going to have writers who plug away at words. 
writers and authors specifically still are the we're, we're the first we're the core idea that then gets turned into a movie and you know everything else that goes along with it video games and everything like that and not every property I mean this is you know a lot of times the novel is what comes after the movie or the video game or something like that but we still look back to Hollywood still looks back to literature to find great stories to tell which they do more of it um, however I do see more collaborative work. I see a lot of book publish, uh, book packaging going on. That has become a huge chunk of our industry, which is, for those who don't know, book packaging is where a publisher uh, has an idea for a novel, comes up with the treatment, comes up with the, all this stuff, and then finds an, an author whose voice mirrors what they're looking for, and then they commission them to write the book. And... That is a huge part of our industry right now. So I see that continuing. I see the creative sense of who's creating the property being varied from either an author or a publisher or maybe even an agent or you know somebody who's got the idea and just needs somebody to execute it. So we might find a little bit more of that going on, collaborative efforts. Um, you know, but... I don't necessarily see the James Patterson model of like I create a treatment and I hand it off to this guy and he creates it and I trade it and we just put our both our names on it and we're done. I don't really see that becoming the main model. Uh, we all kind of, uh, especially as readers, uh, we all complain about these books because they're not like, well, they're not like the original James Patterson's when he was just writing by himself, you know, or it's not like the original Clive Cussler before his son or before the other guys came in, you know, so. I see a lot of that happening with collaborative efforts, so who knows? But no, I don't see the writers going away. Um, I have two points. My original point, but first I'll respond to Brad's point. I've been seeing a few authors. Uh, Janet Ivanovich was the author that I blanked on her name, so I just looked it up. She has put out a lot of books over the last few years where it's her and one other author. I have no idea about the level of collaboration, but they're both co-authors of the same book. And again, I don't know if how much the collaboration has worked. I mean, what the roles are. But my original point was in nonfiction, scientific world, uh, hard science, biology, psychology, yeah, biology, psychology, physics, that collaborative effort is pretty much the norm for writing uh, scientific papers and even textbooks. Um, so what happens for a scientific journal article? especially when the key researchers English as a second or even third language. The science gets done by one person. It gets designed by one person. It gets done possibly by another person. The methods and all that get written up by the person who has the best writing skills. <laughs> then it gets checked over by the other people to make sure it's right. Someone else, sometimes even an undergraduate student, does a whole lot of research to pull in the scientific papers. They get read by the people with the more knowledge after the research is found by somebody else to pick out the facts that support it. It gets written. The introduction and the conclusions get written. They get rewritten by the person that knows the English. Uh, someone that, the yeah, person that hopefully that actually did the science and did the analysis, doubles checks to make sure they're not saying anything that isn't true and there are literally a dozen names on the paper. Pretty much every one of them had a significant hand in the research or writing of the paper. Some of them never even read the finished paper, although all of them were given the opportunity to, but they all had some role in it. And it was all meaningful because now the journals are really getting down to people, putting their names on paper without actually having a meaningful role in the research. But meaningful role in the research could be you actually helped with the data analysis and you had nothing to do with writing the paper. Now, I have actually written, as in done the actual words on the paper, the majority of the writing on several scientific papers. My name were on the papers. I was not the first author on those papers. Those were not primarily my papers, even though they were primarily my words. The writing, science communicating, is a very important part. But again, that's led to the person that can write the best, whoever that person happens to be. 
do they try to replicate the studies at all before this first paper on them goes out? That's a complicated issue and that has to do with scientific whatevers and the answer is it depends. It depends on the type of paper, it depends on the type of study. It, it, it depends on a whole huge list of details and you're getting into scientific validity and p-values and statistical analyses and it depends. <laughs> Okay, then let me ask about yeah. the egos, because I expect all of these people have big egos. Sometimes, sometimes not. Um, in some, Whose name goes on first is yes, very important. Yes, I would think so. In some areas of science, and that's actually important, Brad. That's some, the one that gets indexed. Yeah, yes, it's important. it is. Different yeah, labs important. have different rules. Sometimes it's very clear who should be first. I have a paper that my name really should have been first and ended up being last that has indirectly something to do with why I don't have a PhD, but that's only indirectly. It was indicative of the same problem. Um, but um, Damn that's where uh, basically if you have a PhD student doing a paper and it's based on their PhD thesis, it's supposed to be their name first on the paper. But, um, but um, that was my master's thesis, by the way, not my PhD thesis. PhD thesis was never done. Um, Yet. No, got time. no, I'm not going to do a PhD <laughs> thesis in neuroscience, uh, but, but um, point is, in some areas of science, it's done by alphabetical order, and guess what? People whose name, last names start with a letter early in the alphabet do better than people whose last names start with a letter. So if you have an A last name in one of those things, you tend to do better than if your last name starts with a Z. Mm -hmm. In other fields, it's author's choice, uh -huh. and it just depends on the personalities, and it depends on the... Who has the biggest name? Sometimes, not always, and it also depends on university policies. Let me do finals, finals, and then we can go back off mic and continue. <laughs> yeah. Consi considering that uh, that my last name starts with an S, I'm really glad I did not go in that field. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's only sub-branches because they discovered this because scientists look at everything. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out just like a, um, my own, you know, my own random... You know, prediction for for the industry, like being that uh, I l enjoy writing in like a cinematic style. Um, I feel that you know that, that um, there will be more books that are going to come out using the cinematic universe model that's been out there in recent years. I feel like um, I have a feeling that there will be an author you know coming out there and everything that will put his own sandbox down fill it up with a lot of sand and everything, and then invite a whole lot of other people to come out and play in that sandbox. And so we'll have, you know, we'll have, you know, different characters created by other authors that are going to take place within this same universe. And basically just kind of build up their popularity to the point where they can actually put out their own big, you know, like adventure and everything with all of them together working as, as one big team. So if I've got you right, then I'm going to turn over Brad, and if I'm right, kind of like Marvel Cinematic Universe. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Like yeah, because, I mean, them. because basically, like, you know, somebody can come up and just say, like, hey, I have this character, and it's going to be set in this universe. Why don't you come up with a character, and you come up with a character, and you come up with a character? And that feeling of just, like, that sort of buzz of, oh, this character is linked to this one, we should read this one, and all of a sudden you have like a whole lot of other characters that are coming into play, and then they all get to come together and do one, you know, one big thing. So I can see that happening with uh, with books in the future. I can see that. Actually, some of the pulp writers are already starting to do that. Yeah. Um, you can, if you go into the whole pulp universe, you'll find a lot of crossing over and stuff like that. Um, but what I was going to throw out is. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't see the writer going away, but it may no longer be just the lone experience that, say, you know, somebody has had in, in modern times. Uh, you know, Hollywood has script doctors. Uh, mm -hmm. Technically, the book industry does, too. We call them editors. You know, there'll be, like, copy editors, line editors, you know, all different kinds of editors. And some of these people are brought in to punch up books. Uh, you know, they're especially at the big houses, they'll be like, there's something not right in this. So they'll hand it off to a different editor. Somebody who's, you know, really good at creating the bestseller. You know, and they'll say, hey, turn this book into the next, you know, 
uh, Hunger Games or something like that. So, you know, it's you'll you I think we'll see a lot more of that, especially on the upper end of publishing. You know, where a lot of times now books still come out without having 10, 20 people having touched them. You know, yes, we all, most people have one or two editors who work on their books. Most people have, you know, like of the big five houses, they have, you know, the, the publisher is the, whoever's handling their book, whoever's the head of their imprint or whatever. All these different people have a say in it. So I think you'll see a lot more of that. You know, like, you might be able to be a book doctor, call mm-hmm. yourself that, and walk around and help, you know, Stephen King and J.K. Rowling and all these different big-name authors finish their novels. Or the famous celebrity that really can't write. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, that ghostwriting is a huge thing. Yeah, that's, that's, a, whole that's a whole different math. <laughs> yeah, so that is, that is a whole thing that you can do now, and that is only going to get worse. <laughs> because... No one famous writes their books anymore. <laughs> very few. I mean, very, 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 so very, very, few people who are famous, and, and those are really big books. And yeah, and yet the only the only people that the publishers want are yeah. famous people. Exactly, right. because they want the work done for them. Well, that's exactly. actually to, this the is audience. the sad fact. If you yeah. want to be a writer, go be famous, <laughs> and then publish a book. Yeah. Because you are way more guaranteed to do <coughs> awesome things with and be on TV. And get your butt into, you know, the Daily Show and onto the TV shows and all that kind of stuff. And to be in every magazine and go all over the country if you're famous. That's the sad fact of it. But that's mm-hmm. not cool. So don't do that. <laughs> and, and I'm going to say that as we close out, please, if you're going to do Brad's way at the end there, go be famous. Don't be famous by being a serial killer or anything like that first. And you don't get note, to keep the money if you do that. So you, gotta, you, gotta, you can't permit crimes. Right. Otherwise, so, you don't get to keep the money. And on that note, have a great week writing, and tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. Thank you for listening. Did you know that Write Pack Radio has an international audience? How would you like to reach that audience in regards to your books, your book services, your author services, or more? Go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com and look under advertising for more information. If you don't have a script, that's not a problem. We will be happy to work with you. Once again, go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com for more information. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.